still to come on our program. How governance benefits both open research and education, in the words of the University of Chicago president. In today's governance makes a difference. Coming up right after this break. Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. I'm Tian Wei. Global governance is indispensable because nations increasingly face enormous challenges that cut across borders and global in scale. Governance can benefit from education that hone in fresh talents and ideas. So in our special series today, Governance makes a difference. We get a chance to hear out some of the world's preeminent experts and scholars. Today, we have the president of the University of Chicago as the head of an academic institution with the most Nobel Prize winners. Robert Zimmer emphasized the free and open inquiry in the dead rock of research and education. Take a listen. What do you make of the issue of governance, the qualities of governance when we see all the current issues, you know, exploding around the world? I think uh, governance is in fact very difficult. I mean, it's hard to govern. And I think that one of the things we're seeing is uh, the complexity that people face when they're in when they're in these environments. And this happens in large corporations, it happens in large governments, it happens in international uh, governance questions, it happens in universities. So I, I think these are challenging questions and I think people have to work at them, but they're not, uh, they're not that easy. As an educator, how do you think the ideas about better governance can be also learned and cultivated in the young hearts and young minds on your campus? Well, I think it's an important thing to do. And again, it is quite a uh, complex issue. I think one thing that is extremely important is to uh, talk to everyone constantly about the importance of honesty and absolute integrity in whatever they're doing. Now, honesty and integrity are a foundation because one of the questions about governance is whether there is trust, whether people are going to believe that you're doing things that you say. Not everybody will always agree with you, but it's very important that people believe that you are saying what it is you're doing and you're doing, taking your actions in an, in an honest way and in a way that's filled with integrity, even if they may disagree with exactly what it is you're doing. And I believe this question of uh, trust is an absolutely important, and the question of honesty is absolutely important, mm -hmm. and it provides a foundation for dealing with the complexity of governance, which, as I say, is very complicated and not simple. Trust and honesty, I did notice those two key words you just said. However, if you look at what we are having these days in the world, you notice that is exactly what is lacking here. So. Uh, is this just temporary phenomenon, or this is going to be with us for quite some time? In other words, this generation is likely to be defined by this struggle about trust and also honesty. It's a little hard to say. I think, again, if you take a long view, you see these questions arising. They become more intense than they become uh, less intense. So as somebody who grew up as a student in the 1960s, it's a very tumultuous time around the world. Exactly. And um, How in, did you guys survive? Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah you, somehow uh, here we are. And, and so, you know, you've seen periods like this before. They can't have different qualities because the problems are not the same, but this, this sense of 
needing uh, trust is very important. But it can also be a question of do you agree or disagree with the policies? So what I'd say is honesty and trust are not the only thing, but they form an absolute foundation without which uh, everything becomes more difficult. But what about building trust in America? You've been addressing this issue, Mr. President, to your students over the past two years. Uh, is there a way to do it? Well, one of the things that we've been emphasizing to our students is the importance of actual meaningful discourse, which is that when you have somebody who disagrees with you, it's important to both understand what they're saying, but also to accept the fact that people can disagree with you without being evil. It's one thing to say, I disagree with you and think you're wrong. Uh, it's another thing to say, I disagree with you and therefore you're evil. And I think a very important feature is to have students understand that not all arguments around a certain issue are going to point in the same direction. The world's a complicated place and you need to allow for differences of opinion, which are inevitable and in fact important for coming to reasonable conclusions. People look at what is going on now and wonder whether it is the lowest time in their lifetime when it comes to the changes. Uh, how come they wonder bottom lines, common sense, have already become a luxury in some cases? Mr. President, what do you make of this period of time that we are experiencing right now? Is this the low time or is this the dawn before a big thing happens? I don't know. I just want to ask your insight here. Well, predicting the future is really fraught. <laughs> I don't know anybody who's really very good at that, and I won't, uh, I won't pretend to okay, be. Okay, that's a smart choice. And, and what about your analysis of this? Yeah, but looking back, um, the 20th century had some periods of, of extreme destruction at massive scale that... Um, is almost unimaginable, except when you continue to look back in history. So uh, we shouldn't imagine that we're in some uh, period where we're at the bottom of, that, um, of the things humanity has shown itself capable of doing. On the other hand, it's uh, obviously a complex time uh, with a lot of change, a lot of unrest, a lot of dissatisfaction, a little a lot of questions about the quality of governance and we have to try to get ourselves into a better spot so that we don't see repetitions of this kind of massive destruction. Where is that better spot? A uh, better spot is one where people are not being murdered, where there's enough conversation mm -hmm. so that the kind of miscalculations that can take place are minimized. Uh, where people can uh, think about competing because competing is a healthy thing, uh, but that uh, they're doing so in straightforward, honest ways without demonizing uh, the others. And uh, if we can get to that spot, that would be a better spot. Amid China-U.S. trade tensions, Mr. Zimmer, the president of University of Chicago, sent a university-wide email this June in which he stressed the University of Chicago would keep its commitment to support international students and academics. He continued to encourage interactions in science and technology and cultural exchanges among campuses around the world. During his visit to Wuhan University this June, he said his university would still welcome Chinese students and scholars. He said international engagement would go on despite difficulties. Let's listen to another part of our interview with the University of Chicago president. You were voicing your opinion directly about U.S.-China issue. And you said openly, University of Chicago would welcome international students, just as before. Now, how much does that take political guts to be able to say it? 
I think it's honestly uh, pretty straightforward. Um, it's been something that the university's believed in for a long time. We've made a very big effort recently uh, to do yet more of it, and uh, we had a very clear path, and we are uh, committed to the path. And so we went ahead and continued to do it. I would assume it could not be done without some kinds of opposition, verbally or non-verbally. Not really. I think there's a degree of uh, there's a degree of question in the United States. I think, as everybody knows, about the relationship, particularly with uh, China. Uh, there are issues around uh, uh, evaluation of various immigration policies and so on. So there, there are definitely things in the air that raise a lot of questions. But when you have a very clear view of what the nature of your education is, is about, what the nature of the research environment that you want to create is, create is, and you see the absolute importance of being uh, open and welcoming to people from all countries, it becomes uh, easier to know what to do. When you think about issues as extreme as decoupling, how much does that impact your understanding of the potential of, you know, state-to-state -state relations and also educational cooperation? Well, when we uh, began doing more in China and having more Chinese students come uh, to Chicago, this goes back now you know, over a dozen years, uh, honestly, we knew that there would be times when the U.S.-China relations would be better, there'd be times when they'd be worse. These are two big, complex countries with a lot of uh, interests in common and a lot of uh, competitive interests. And so it's just inevitable that there'll be times when things are better and worse. We're a long-term institution. Uh, we take a long view. Uh, our research programs take a long time. Our education programs take a long time. And so we need to be focused on what it is we can do, which is provide outstanding education and a great research environment. What do you think it might be some of the things the University of Chicago could tell the stories to the others in your country or elsewhere about what should be the real essence of things when it comes to cooperation, Mr. President? Yeah, I think there are uh, several things. First of all, people actually need to understand what's going on in the other country much better. If you're sitting in the United States and you look at China, you've got this massive transformation and people in all sorts of disciplines studying all sorts of things are going to and should want to simply understand how do you think about that? Um, what can we learn from it? What can the world learn from it? How does one uh, reflect one's assumptions about how to do things based on this? Where is China uh, succeeding that provide lessons to others? Where is it not succeeding and doesn't provide lessons? So there's a lot to learn from understanding this, and it's so important. Uh, likewise, I think there's an enormous amount uh, to learn uh, for Chinese students and faculty coming to the United States. So I think just from the point of view of providing a good education and a good research environment, this is uh, exceeding, these exchanges are exceedingly important. Uh, on the other hand, I think they all obviously also have a long-term benefit to two societies understanding each other and ultimately figuring out how to work together well over time. Mr. President, the University of Chicago is well known worldwide for churning out the best talent in the academic world. If you look at the number of Nobel Prize winners uh, that were originally or related to the University of Chicago, it's the biggest possibly. So how do you look at the quality of academic research, basic research, and as a president of the university, how much do you have to put into the long-term thinking about basic research? Long-term basic research is an absolute foundation of what we do at the University of Chicago, and it needs to be an important feature of, of every institution and we create and sustain an environment where people can challenge current paradigms, think about things in very, very different ways, have their ideas tested by ongoing challenge, and this is part of the environment at the University of Chicago that produces so many people who contribute so many new ideas. What do you really think, fundamentally, Mr. President, 
is the role of universities? Role of universities, I think, is really uh, threefold. First is to educate students. And what does that mean? It means to provide them with a set of skills, not just knowledge, but intellectual skills and capacities that's going to serve them for their entire life. How do we think about complex problems? How do we challenge assumptions? How do we look at different points of view? And how do they come together? And how can students learn to make their own synthesis out of these very complex questions and complex world? Do you have to build a great wall in a way to safeguard your students so that they could still have access to the kinds of freedom of opportunities and engagement that they should deserve? Yeah, there are certainly a lot of pressures uh, around uh, constraining speech, constraining discourse. These have always existed. Sometimes they're more extreme, sometimes they're less extreme. What about now? Uh, now I would say there's quite a bit of, uh, of pressure around this. And uh, we've made a very uh, strong statement about this, now known as the Chicago Principles, but endorsed by over 65 other institutions. And uh, we simply believe very strongly in the importance of this type of education. And uh, we aim to protect it. And do we you do. need to persuade the others, the 65 who signed on this, who you, which you are beginning? Well, I respect other institutions having to figure out what it is they do. I mean, I clearly have an opinion as to what the nature of the most outstanding education is. And we make it very clear, and it's part of the motivation for the, uh, for the Chicago principles. But ultimately, every institution needs to figure out for itself what it is, because otherwise it won't be effective just giving them advice.